Becky and I have been with Word of Grace uh, from the beginning, and well, I had a lot of memories from those early days as things were getting started. And, uh, and then for us, as we were getting started a few years, actually a few years after Word of Grace started, we uh, launched our journey into, uh, into China, and Word of Grace was one of, if, if I, was just, I was thinking about this morning, it, it may have been actually the first church that, that supported us. Uh, as we were missionaries going to China. So very special for us to be, to be with everybody here in this room and with all of you watching on, online today. So, you know, I, again, knowing that we were coming back today, uh, first thing up for me was just to say thank you. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness, praying for us I mean, you know, from the very beginning. Um, and that's, that's just amazing to us, and we're very, very grateful. I don't think we can really find the words to, ex to express how grateful we are uh, to have this ongoing relationship over all of these years. So, uh, and okay, and so we uh, just want to say thanks. I think that's where we uh, wanted to start with by saying thank you. Uh, it, 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 again, I can't hardly find the words. Thank you don't seem uh, uh, the, the good enough. So I also specifically wanted to communicate what we are doing in China. Uh, because, you know, especially when I'm back in the U.S., I'm usually back once a year, you know, I'm often asked, you know, what's it like in China? What's it like living in China? And, you know, and people hear a lot of different things, you know, and we like to say that if you've heard it about China, it's probably true somewhere. You know, I mean, it's a big country. It's 1.4 billion people. And, I, uh, and I'll say it, it'd be like, you know, it's like a, a, a Chinese friend asking me in China, can you describe what life is like in the United States in two or three sentences? And well, that's a little complicated. <laughs> two or three sentences. It's a big country with a lot of people. And, and it's so, but our experience in China, and Ryan mentioned this earlier, is, is unique. Um, what I do there, Becky and I do, is my primary role is I'm the pastor of an international church uh, in Shanghai, China. Now, Shanghai is uh, China's largest city. It's, most, it's its most international city. Uh, it's about uh, 25 or 27 million people. Uh, and so, you know, just again, I, even, even today after 20 years, I'm still amazed sometimes at how large that is. I can, get, I can get on the subway, I can ride for an hour and a half and come up out of the ground and I'm still in Shanghai. You know, just like, wow. And, 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 and you know, just waves and waves of people all the time. And just the other day, I, I, I don't know, I forgot where I was, but uh, I came up out again, came out of the subway again and I thought, wow, there's a lot of people here. And I thought, there's a lot of people here every day, you know, so it's kind of like, it's like that's, that, doesn't, that never really changes. But anyways, it's just, even after all these years, I still like to take note of that, like, wow, there's a lot of people here. And, um, uh, but this position that I have is, is very unique. And, and uh, there, are, there are just actually a handful of people that can say that they are in China um, to do gospel work uh, openly, uh, which is what I'm doing. So there are just a handful of people who can say that. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm one of them. Uh, it's just by God's grace that 20 some years ago, uh, through a series of circumstances that, that I had no control over, could not ar arrange myself, the opportunity to come into China as a pastor just opened itself up. And so I did go to be the pastor of this international church. Now, you know, life in China, uh, as, uh, as we've already heard, there, there are a lot of restrictions there. And it's, uh, it's not an open society like the US or other Western countries. Uh, and you live with those restrictions. And one of the things I've really learned uh, and to appreciate is uh, the, the, uh, of what it means to live in the world but not be of the world. And um, I thought maybe I would have had an understanding of that was, what that was like or what that meant as an American living in the US. I'm from Ohio, so what does it mean to be someone from Ohio who lives in Ohio be in the, as a Christian and to be in the world but not of this world? And then it was a whole nother thing to be a foreigner living in a country where I'm not a citizen, to be in that world and not be of that world. In some ways, it was a little easier to see the distinction because I really was not of that world. <laughs> I'm not Chinese, I'm never going to be. Um, and, uh, but yet, to explore what it means to be a citizen of God's kingdom, you know, and that separation. And of course, China is the kind of place where if you're curious or wondering what that separation might look like, they're going to help you with that <laughs> because they're going to make that separation very clear. And so in my role, uh, China, I think, allows for uh, – China's very restrictive when it comes to foreigners and the way foreigners and local people interact. 
even at a, even at a business level, commercially, economically, uh, it's just an interesting place to live. There's a lot of control and direction when you're a foreigner living in China, but especially in the area of religion. It's very sensitive. And uh, so there's a space that opens up where someone like me can interact with both internationals and with local people. And that's kind of my space. Now, many people have heard that you know China has an underground church and a, a lot of uh, American Christians have heard of that. Uh, and I know, and I know uh, a lot of people in that arena. Primarily, I work with people in what's called the state church. And so there is a state church in China. There are state churches all over the world. Different states have, have their own official church, and so does China. And so uh, a lot of pastors that I know and work with are part of the state church. And uh, we get to interact. You know, I'm a part of kind of bringing it down. I'm a part of a local state church in the city of Shanghai. So I work closely with the pastors of, in that local church, the people who are part of that church, and get to interact with Chinese people on a regular basis. Again, it's not, it's not like wide open, like it might be here in Ohio, just kind of do whatever God puts on your heart, just go do that, you know. Uh, it doesn't work quite like that, but it's more a matter of kind of taking the opportunities that are presented to you, right? You know, that, and, and, and often you're waiting on those opportunities to be presented to you. And you can kind of work behind the scenes, and you do, and I kind of make something happen and push it here and push over there. But, but for the most part, you realize you're not in charge, and, um, and opportunities will come, but you have to watch for them. And when they do come, you have to be ready. Uh, and so I love the interaction I've had with, with people, the people of China, my friends there, uh, and it's been a real growth time for me. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine what life would be like without, without these 20 years in China. It's really a, a, really a great blessing. And uh, during and after COVID time, we have been kind of relaunching. And so that's kind of a time we're in right now. We're kind of relaunching a lot of things. And you can pray for us in that way. Because um, while everything got shut down during COVID, um, the church that we church building we met in was also being renovated. Uh, so during the renovation, COVID happened and kind of the perfect storm, uh, which set everything back a number of days. So we did not meet for over three years. So we're now kind of basically restarting, uh, and and under a, a new set of circumstances. So yeah, pray for us as we kind of re re gearing back up again. You know, there's still a great spiritual hunger in China. I get asked regularly. People ask me, uh, you know, can you tell me, I understand you're a Christian. Can you tell me more about that? You know, I understand that Jesus has something to do with Christianity. What does Jesus have to do with Christianity? And so there are many opportunities like this that come to us. We just get very naturally just kind of nice conversations we have, we, we have with, with people. Um, uh, this morning, I want to go back and tell a story I would have told uh, 20 some years ago, uh, when uh, probably my very first uh, time at Word of Grace, um, and uh, so you may not remember that story, uh, you may never have heard it, but uh, it may sound familiar to you when I start telling it. So Becky and I, as I mentioned, we're from Ohio, and I was a pastor here in o in Ohio. So um, we were married for 16 years. We could not have children. We had to birth children our of our own. We went through a, a time, a prayerful time of reflecting, what are we going to do? Are we going to just be a child that doesn't have, without, without children? Are we going to be a, a, or be a couple without children? Are we going to adopt? And through prayer and, you know, kind of walking through a process, you know, yeah, I think we're going to adopt. That's what we, we feel kind of led by God to, to do that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we didn't know anything about adoption. So wait, we knew there was such a thing as international adoption, but it never really occurred to us that, that making the decision to adopt internationally led to another decision, which would have, was going to be which country. And, oh, okay, okay, yeah, I guess that makes sense. If There's a lot of countries out there that participate in international adoption. So that led us to a whole other time of praying and, okay, God, we want to be led by you on this, which country, and Becky and I prayed together. We, we landed on China and um, went through all the process, paperwork. Uh, we were matched with a child, and then we had a waiting period where we had to wait until we could go to China to, to, to get our child. And uh, during this time of waiting, um, you know, people, of course, people in the church we were, we were pastoring, they knew, friends and family knew, and then eventually friends of friends and people that we didn't even know knew our story because someone told them our story about, hey, this couple is going to China to adopt a, a child there. And uh, so this started happening. 
uh, people were, would say, oh, I understand you're going to China. Maybe this will turn into like some kind of calling for you. Maybe this is a whole new life direction for you. And I'm like, no, not really. I'm just, I have no, I'm not looking for, I'm not looking for a life direction. I'm just, I'm just going to go to China, adopt my child, and come right back to Ohio, you know, because that's where I want. I like living in Ohio. I have no intention of never, ever leaving here. And really, that's kind of where I, where I had no vision of my life for what I was doing, and which was, was awesome. You know, it was no reason not to go or to go. It was, it was, a, good, it was a good life. And, uh, but actually, people continue to do this randomly. Just people. And then the funny thing was, it was people I didn't even know. I would meet them. Oh, I heard about you. You're the guy that's going to China. You know? And you know, maybe that's going to be some new direction or calling for you. Like, I don't even know you. How do you what are you telling me? So I came home, and I told Becky one time, after it happened multiple times like this, because I, you know, in hindsight, I think, God, something was going on. You know, so there was a stirring going on. I just wanted to deny it. Like, I, I do not want this to happen. And um, so I said, you know, I, seriously, I, I am not interested in going to China. I mean, living there and in any capacity, actually. I, I just want to go and adopt Emily and come right back. And in fact, if, if, if God were to do something like redirect my life at this point, he would have to have someone call my name out loud while I'm there. And my, my, my meaning was, it's impossible. It's not going to happen. I don't even know anyone in China, so that's not going to happen. So we do go, we get to China, we're there for a couple of days before we go to the city where our daughter is living. And we do actually know one person, literally one person in China, it's a, 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 actually a pastor of an international church, a Cantonese speaking church in Hong Kong, uh, who I'd met about a year before. And he said, hey, if you ever come, or I think he, I, we knew we were going to eventually get to China. So he gave us his address and said, look me up. So we got to Hong Kong. We had his address. And we said, well, we have got a couple days before we fly. So we asked the concierge. They said, oh, yeah, this address is like two blocks from here. So I said, oh, great. So we, we walk over. We walk to the building. It's actually a, a, you have to be in Hong Kong. It's packed with things. It's, shops and restaurants and buildings. A lot, a lot of churches actually meet in office buildings. So uh, it's an office building. We get to the floor. The church name is on the door, and it says, we have moved. <laughs> and, and, but it doesn't say where they've moved. And I said, well, who puts a sign on their door that says, we have moved, you know, and then it doesn't tell you where, you know? And we realize at that moment that all we have is an address. We don't have uh, Pastor Lucier's phone number, or email. We have no contact information. We just have this address. So we thought, well, okay, we tried. We came, this is it. I have no idea where he is. Uh, I have no idea even how to find him. You know, I've never been in Asia before. I've never been here before. So we tried. So we walk back, and it starts to rain, and we have lots of time. We're not in a hurry, and we don't want to, you know, so, well, let's just go, let's go into one of these little restaurants we pass, and we'll just drink some tea and wait for the rain to stop. Um, so we walk in. We're trying to tell the waiter why we're here. Uh, it turns out we're actually in a Vietnamese restaurant. We're in, we're in Hong Kong in a Vietnamese restaurant, but we have no clue where we have no clue. And um, and while we're trying to explain what we're we're wanting some tea, blah blah, you know, all that, we hear, "Hey, Dale. Hey, Becky." And in the we have we have randomly, or maybe not so randomly, walked into the restaurant where the only person we know is eating lunch. And he sees us, and he calls our name out. And, and we're like, whoa, you know. First off, I, I, Becky looked at me and said, do you know what just happened? And I had forgotten I'd said, but I, she did not forget. And so she, I said, yeah, I, I, yeah, I know. We just, uh, Pastor Lucy is right over there, you know. And she said, no, no. She said, you said you would have to have your name called out loud. And your name was just called out. And, you know, that led to a series of things that eventually, maybe about a year after that, uh, uh, Becky, Becky was the one who said, Dale, if, if we don't go to China, we're, gonna, we're going to be knowingly disobedient. And we have those moments in our lives as followers of Jesus where he's expressing himself so clearly, maybe something in the word that you've read or through the Bible or through a prophetic word or through a brother or sister in church or something. But it's so clear, to, it's, it's like so clear to you anyway that, that the Spirit is speaking that you cannot not obey it or, or because you would know consciously, 
I'm, this is a conscious act of disobedience. <laughs> At this point, I know that I'm being disobedient. And we knew, and that's where we were. And so we got on a plane, and we, we went to China. We didn't, we didn't know why we were going there. We didn't, we didn't have a, uh, a, like a like vision for we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. We just went in obedience. Uh, we went uh, knowing that we were going to have to study the language, um, which we did. Uh, and I had no idea that one day I would become the pastor of an international church. Uh, and we do, uh, you know, we, we ministered and served people from all over the world, up to 100 different countries, uh, uh, a, a lot of people from China. So it's an inner, in, inner interesting space where the world is kind of coming together. Uh, and and it's, it's really been a neat opportunity to do that. And, and, and this idea of, or this not just idea, but this experience of having my name called out like this, made me think of a story in the Bible uh, from the book of Acts and it's such an important story that it gets repeated three times. And you know in the Bible, when you're reading the Bible, when something gets repeated like that, you just can just go ahead and automatically assume it's important. You know, this must, this must be a significant something here because God saw fit to repeat it multiple times. And it's the story of a man named Cornelius, so Acts 10, and then gets told again in Acts chapter 11, and then it gets referred to a third time in Acts chapter 15. All right, so... In Acts chapter 10, the, the first time uh, it goes like this. At, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, called him by name. Cornelius stared at him in fear, which was a very typical response when you had an angel show up and start talking to you. It's like, whoa, what is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. So now send men to Joppa, another a city about a few days away by, by, by foot, to bring back a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with Simon, another man named Simon, who is a tanner, and a tanner is a person that makes uh, leather goods from the hides of animals. That's what a tanner does. And he lives in a house by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants, and uh, one of them was a devout soldier who was one of his attendants, and he told them everything that had happened and then sent him to Joppa. So here's Cornelius. He is uh, not a Jewish person but he is a non-Jewish pe person, also called a Gentile, who loves God, loves Yahweh, and, and is attentive to Yahweh, prays to Yahweh, cares about other people, like Jewish people who also know Yahweh. He's not fully Jewish. He's probably not keeping the Jewish dietary laws. He's, uh, he, so he's not eating kosher. He's probably not circumcised. I mean, he doesn't do all those typical Jewish things, but he's, he knows the God of the Jewish people, Yahweh, and he's devoutly serving him and praying to him on a regular basis. And, and one day, he gets this a, an angelic visitor, right? And, and, and Cornelius is told to send for someone who he has no idea who this person is. Can, can you imagine this kind of a thing? You know, God just speaking to you and saying, send for and gives you a name. And you, and you don't know the name. You've never, you don't know this person. It, it's, it's a name. He just gives you a name, and he says, send for this man, and he's living in this city, and he's staying with this person, and this would have been a particular person, like, so Simon the Tanner by, who lives in a house by the sea, when you walked into Joppa, these are not real big places, they would have known, because sometimes you look at this, he doesn't have Google Maps, he doesn't have, he doesn't have an Apple phone, you know, how, how's he going to find this guy? You walk in a little town of Joppa, just start asking people for Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea, they're going to tell you pretty quickly right over there. That's how you get there. And, and that's what's happening, right? So off, so off he goes. He sends, he sends some people. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey approaching the city of Joppa, Peter, back to Peter, the man that, that he, they've come looking for, goes up to the roof of the house to pray. So these are uh, first century homes. The roof was almost like another room. It's a flat roof, and people met up there, they had dinner up there, they took a nap up there, so, so really not unusual, right? And that's what he's doing. Verse 10, he becomes hungry while he's up there on the roof, 
and wanted something to eat. And while he was, the meal was being prepared for him, he fell into a trance. And he's just kind of just probably asleep or just kind of like dreamlike state. And he saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Peter replies, surely not, Lord. I, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made uh, clean. So, again, th this is uh, a Peter, a Jewish man. He's been eating kosher food and uh, very strict dietary, uh, following these very strict dietary laws. You can read about him in Leviticus and Numbers in the Old Testament since he was a child, probably as long as he could possibly remember. Now he's an adult, you know, he's been following Jesus and he's a Christian like this and, and, and still keeping these same dietary laws. When he has this vision and this sheet comes down and it's got all the food and all the animals that he would have never eaten, you know, because as a good Jewish man, he was told you should not eat these things. Loving Yahweh means you don't eat these foods. Here he's telling this voice from heaven, telling him it's okay, you can start eating shrimp and, you know, all the other things on this sheet. And, of course, his response is, you know, no, no, even, even, even a voice from heaven couldn't convince him to do this. That's how ingrained this, this thinking is. You, know, you do not do this. And, but this voice from heaven is God telling him, no, but there's the explanation. Do not call anything unclean that I am calling clean. And that's the thing that's really kind of leaving. That's, it, it left the impression on Peter as it should leave on us. God is moving. God is moving on. He's moving forward. He is bringing new definitions. And, and, and Peter needed to pay attention to that and follow. And God is like that. You know, it, it's God's way. And if God wants to redefine his way, if God wants to do a new thing, he can. It might be uncomfortable for us, and it often is uncomfortable for us. And like Peter, we might even feel the temptation or the, 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 it makes sense to us to say, no, I've never done that, you know, and no, I've always done it this way. And, you know, and, and I think God is gracious and understands. I, and I'm sure he was, and he's kind enough to Peter to actually give him the same vision and experience three times in a row. Because, well, like some of us, you know, to really hear God's voice and obey, we need to hear it three times. Or we might even need to have, or have somebody call our name out loud in a little restaurant in Hong Kong. You know, we just we we need that kind of thing, right? And I think that's part of God's grace to us to say, "I love you. I, I want to help you obey me and follow me." So you're going to get this message three times. You know, this is me talking to you, and that's 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 what's happening here uh, for Peter. Uh, and so it happens to him three times. Um, Surely not, Lord. He said, "I've never eaten anything like this before." And the voice speaks to him a second time. This happened, verse 16, three times. And then the sheet was taken back up into heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, was known, Simon who was known as Peter, was staying there. All right, so again, just, you know, the, it's, like, it's almost like a movie, you know, like you've got these two very dynamic stories. They're happening side by side. And, and then here's, here's the point of the story where they come together. They, they overlap. You've got, you've got Cornelius and the three guys, the vision, the angel, you know, go. And you've got Peter on the rooftop. He's got a vision of food coming down on a sheet. You know, don't call anything unclean. I've called clean. You've got a Gentile that who Peter, as a Jewish person, would never associate with, you know. And it all kind of comes together. It all overlaps right there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, there are three men who are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them. I have sent them. Don't call anything unclean that I have called clean. Three non-Jewish guys are down here, downstairs, and they're asking uh, you to go with them. Not only are they not Jewish, they're totally outside of Peter's people group, uh, but he doesn't know them. <laughs> He's such a real... Because, Three Jewish guys or three Gentile guys. I don't know you, you know, and, and you're asking me to just, like, go with you? Again, imagine sometimes these, these Bible stories, you know, they're so familiar to us, we forget them in their context, how odd and demanding this kind of thing is, right? Three guys you don't know come to your house of a different people group and say, come with us. You say, 
no, it's probably going to be your first response. You know, no, no, I'm not coming. I don't even know you. You know, and but God has seen fit. And Peter, to his credit, same guy that got out of the boat, said, "Okay, I'll go." Imagine, he's, I, I, you know, again, it's a really kind of amazing his the level of faith on Peter's part to say, "I'll go." But God is speaking to him. And Peter went down and said, "I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come?" They tell him the whole story. They told him about Cornelius, the centurion. He says he's a God, righteous man, he's God-fearing, and all the, the, everything he repeats the whole thing. And then, of course, the, Peter invites these men into his house. Good Middle Eastern hospitality demands that they come in and have a meal together. It's probably late in the afternoon, too early to start the journey back to Caesarea. So, again, all kinds of cultural barriers are being broken, um, and here they go. This whole vision, three times uh, repeated. It's like getting the same dream three nights in a row. I mean, that would get your attention, wouldn't it? You know, the same exact dream, same people, same words, same conversations, three nights in a row. He's got, he's got Peter's attention for sure. And there's all this stuff that's going on in this story. It reminds me in some ways of the life that I'm living. You know, I, that, you know this, these, these cross-cultural barriers that we're always crossing uh, for the sake of the kingdom. And, and God's always asking us to kind of go a little farther. And God's always asking us to seem to be doing things that, that gets us out of our comfort zone. You know, he says, I, I'm not comfortable with that. But let's, let's just trust me. Just, just go with me. Just follow me. And I, and I think that's such a God way of it being at work in our life. Trust me. Follow me. And, that's, this, is, and this is a great story uh, where this is happening. Um, I think another principle here is seeing how God attentively, attentively was preparing Peter. It's such a, this whole idea that, that there's so much preparation going on in our lives and we don't even realize it. Uh, uh, pastor Chuck Smith, who was a pastor during the Jesus movement in the 1960s, you know, he used to say, you know, God is always preparing us for what's next. Just, God is, just, just, just take it to the bank, you know, just own it, just accept, just own it. God is always preparing us for what's next. And, and, and you can see that. This is a story from the Bible that helps us to see that so clearly. You know, so obviously, God is always preparing us for what's next. Um, uh, you can imagine if, if, um, if Peter was the answer to Cornelius' prayer, it make, made me wonder what was Cornelius praying for. You know, what was Cornelius praying for that, that Peter and this whole story was the answer and, and, uh, and uh, response? Again, I love the increasing sense of expectation and anticipation that's going on here in this story. God is involved. The Holy Spirit is present. Something's happening. Something we can anticipate. Something that will be from him. Something that will be good, but uncomfortable. And here we are. Uh, kind of like, again, a lot of experiences as living as a native Ohioan in China. A lot of, lot of uncomfortableness. Is that the word? Um, you know, a lot of discomfort, uh, a lot of newness, a lot of things I've never seen before, uh, learning different cultures, different ways of doing things, um, and, and, uh, uh, but yet uh, here we are, here we are. You know, I think a lot of times for me that um, sometimes the tension in these cultural, cross-cultural situations is a lot to do with expectations, you know, and uh, I just, you, and, and you know, you learn that about yourself pretty quickly because you're now living in a place and with a people that are probably not going to do things the way you expect someone to do them. And uh, so we have funny stories. So, you know, uh, in, in most of Asia anyway, I'm just assuming, I'm just attributing this to there's a lot of people there. There's billions of people that live in Asia, billions of people that live, in, in, a, a billion live in China. So, so when you're lined up, you know, whether it's at the post office or a noodle restaurant or McDonald's, wherever you are, uh, you know, as a good an American, there's a nice proper space between people, right? You got to, you kind of watch that. You want to get in somebody's personal space. But, you know, I learned quickly, well, maybe not so quickly, it took me a while, that you can't, if you give yourself a nice proper space, someone's going to come along and stand in that space. Now you're like one person back, you know? And you say, but instinctively, I think, oh, I need to stand back a little bit because give the person in front of me a little space. So I did that. Another person stepped in front of me. I said, no, no, I'm two people back. 
You know, and I, so I just instinctively, I back up some more. You know, I was like, I'm now another person's step in front. I'm now three people back. So I eventually I thought, you know, this is not going to work. <laughs> I, I remember one time uh, uh, I get to the front. And uh, the other thing about this cultural thing is that, you know, uh, Westerners in general, we like to queue up, as they say, or line up one by one. You know, there's the other way of queuing up. It's called the, it's called the pine tree, where all these com people come in at different angles, right? And that's how they do it where in China, you know, and other places. So, and, and so I learned that when I, find, when I finally get to the counter, I put my hand on the counter over here so no one can kind of come in from the side. It's a little, if you ever get to Asia, that's a little trick. I'm just you know, telling you. Put your hands on the counter so nobody can come in from the sides. And the thing, but the thing is, is that in all of this tension, uh, confusion, frustration, sometimes full-on chaos, God is at work. God is at work. And it's easy to, at that point, say, God is not at work because it's so crazy. But actually, God is at work in, in, in this. He's stretching us. There are two, two key principles I just want to take away as I wrap things up uh, this morning uh, from this story. Especially, it's, it's, it's this, don't call, don't call unclean what I have called clean. And because uh, it gets repeated, and it seems to be pretty significant. And I, and I, and I just paraphrase it in this way. When it comes to the God of the Bible, keep an open heart and an open mind. When it comes to relating to the God of the Bible, keep an open heart and an open mind and do the same thing with other people. And maybe most importantly, keep an open heart and an open mind towards yourself. There's a lot of things going on in our world that's not being captured by CNN and Fox and BBC and Reuters and on and on, whoever your favorite news source is. There's a lot of things going on in our world that doesn't, it's not going to show up in those kinds of places. But there are very much kingdom things that are happening that are going to show up as God shows up and his spirit communicates with us, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing in this place. And then we listen, you know, we'll see it and we'll hear it. And then we can participate in it. And then my second principle is this. Don't miss the opportunity whenever it comes to talk about Jesus. Whenever the opportunity comes to you or to me to talk about Jesus, take it. Take it. You never know what's going on right now. And especially if someone appears to be actually asking you questions about spiritual truth. It might be just something that because they know you and they know your life and they know that somehow you're different, you know, in, in, in a good way, different. <laughs> you know, that, you know, that the choices that you're making, uh, the values that you have, uh, or maybe, and so often it is like this, they're just hurting. People are just hurting. And they're looking for healing and hope and some kind of firm ground to stand on. And where they might have been opposed to hearing anything about Christian faith or Jesus or no thank you, right? But at this moment in their life, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. And being attentive to that and being ready to just talk about Jesus when you have the opportunity. You don't have to be a brilliant Bible scholar. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to the whole, don't have the whole Bible memorized. You know, a lot of times we feel we feel ill prepared. We don't we feel not equipped. You know, that we let's you know, I just oh, what if somebody asks me a question I can't answer? Uh, no, no problem. Just just tell your story, tell your testimony of God's presence in your life, and the way He comforted and helped and gave you strength, and and the Holy Spirit will speak through that to the person that you're talking to. As, as a friend of mine, a mentor of mine used to say, uh, trust the process. Trust the process. God is at work. All right? And uh, I, I want to I pray for you, uh, Word of Grace and Pastor, and, uh, because uh, uh, I, think, I think a lot of these connections that we have are not coincidental, um, and especially when they become long-term. You know, it's the reason why we know each other and we're in relationship with each other uh, for as, for as long as we are, and, and, then he, and, and then for him to continue to bring us back together again and again. So I'd love to pray for you. So Father, I pray today, I thank you, God, that you are the kind of God who is God for everyone and everywhere. 
And you are always at work by your spirit. You're at work in China. Yeah, even, even places where it says you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't have a church here. There's lots of camps, a lot of closed doors in China, but you are making a way to reach people. Here in Ohio, same thing. You are making a way to reach lost people because, because, Father, lost people still matter to you. So I pray, God, that you would help us to have attentive ears to listen, what the Spirit would say, not only to those that you are drawing to yourself, but what the Spirit would say to us who already know you. I bless Word of Grace. I give thanks for this community of faith, our relationship over these 20 plus years. And Father, I pray that as the future is coming up very quickly, that you have already been preparing them for what you have planned for them as a community. So I pray strengthen the leadership, strengthen Pastor Ryan, strengthen the leaders that they might work as one and in unity with each other, fill them with a love for you and a love for others. Father God, renew within them a spirit, a right spirit. Refresh them as they go forward. Strengthen their hands. Thank you, Father God, that you are a God who always finds a way to strengthen us for what you have called us to do. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.